minutes Sadia, two minutes Elia. Let's hope by 12. That'll be sorted. Oh, yeah! I, <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited when this finally works. Um, okay, wait. This is the Novalo Learning Center page, right? Yeah, it is. Yes, this is yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, I'm so excited. So, this is working. We are about to go live. Oh my gosh, we haven't talked, we haven't spoken for, for a while. Look at your hair. Your hair looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it looks thank great. you. <laughs> it really I miss you. I, I miss you too. I really do miss you. Um, so guys, um, okay, it's one minute before 12, but, but okay, let me introduce Sadia. So as you guys know, because last time we did have um, an IG Live, Sadia is a text lecturer. She lectures, you lecture third year as well as second year, right? Text. Only third year this year. Only third year this year, yes. Yeah. So what's exciting is that um, third year students just wrote a VET test, right? So you've been marking this, you've been seeing all the mistakes, and I really did think, and people have been voicing their concerns around the VET issues. So I thought this would be a great time to actually discuss this and see what we can share with the students. So guys, remember, Sadia has a BCom Honors in Tags and she's currently completing, like she's almost, almost done with her Master's in Tags. She's very knowledgeable in this area. So just, just, yeah, just hang on tight and tell your friends, just share this live video. But if they can't be live right now, I'll be able to save it onto my highlights because this one is on my platform. So we'll just, it's 12 o'clock now. We will just start. Is there anything you want to say, Sadia, before we start? I'm just going to go through the tips you have sent me so that you can elaborate more on it. Okay. And guys, if Sadia says anything and you have a question, please type your question below. Yes, yes, Sadia? <laughs> no, just wanted to say that um, this is from a third year perspective, but also from a second year. So if you are in second year, third year, or honors, um, I'm trying to make the tips applicable for everyone. Um, so it's not in too much detail, um, but if you have specific questions, um, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, and I really do hope you guys find this helpful. Like Zanelli said, uh, my students just wrote VAT. So um, I do have a little bit of insight as to the wonderful mistakes that everyone made. So hoping it helps everyone. I'm sure it will. As I was writing the tips that you said, you, you sent me through, I was like, oh my gosh, it's been a while ever since I've done that, but I was like, this is super, super helpful. So let's dive into it. The first thing that you spoke about was not fully understanding the difference between exempt as well as zero rated. Please tell us more about that one. Okay, that's an interesting one. So a lot of students confuse the difference between zero rated and exempt supplies. So what will happen is that they understand in terms of output VAT what's zero rated and exempt, mm -hmm. but then they forget that when it comes to input VAT, um, if it's an exempt entity, that you cannot claim the input VAT because of the fact that it's an exempt entity. Mm -hmm. But for zero rated, you can, even though you aren't technically claiming any VAT because it's at zero rated. So that one made a mistake I think most of my students make. It's just not understanding the concept and then confusing zero rated and exam supplies. And then the same thing happens with if you have an entity that has, that has a, that's a split entity. So either they're making taxable supplies and then exam supplies as well. So when they see the ratio percentage, they don't understand the 95% de minimis rule and um, I think reading is also a major thing because of time constraints. So um, I think, yeah, understanding what is zero rated, what is exempt, and what does it mean if an entity is zero rated and exempt? Can I or can't I claim the VAT? Why can't I claim it? And asking yourself these questions help because when you're doing a question, be it test two or the exam, um, if you can ask these questions and answer it to yourself, you can then... Um, answer it correctly and um, have the, the right answer for that specific question. So, yeah. Okay, okay. So the issue is, do you think most of the students understand the output side when it comes to that exempt and zero rated, but then, you, oh, they also don't get that. Because <laughs> I thought 
the main issue is when it comes to claiming. Isn't that the main issue? It is sort of the main issue, but then there's also this confusion between input and output VAT where yeah. people um, sometimes tend to not understand and they confuse the two concepts. So it's, it's almost like yes and no, if you understand what I mean. Yes, yes. Um, the ones that understand input and output then go and confuse it when it comes to claiming. The ones that don't understand either input or output confuse it all around and then get the entire question incorrect. Um, so for those of you who are also confused and like what output and what input, I'll tell you from the perspective of how I explain my students. Mm -hmm. So think of output that is the groceries or the services going out of the shop. You've collected the money, therefore you need to pay sales. So think of people walking out of a grocery shop with bags. And input that is uh, money that you can claim from sales because your goods are being delivered and it's coming into the shop. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's just a very simple and sort of easy way to remember it. But most people make the big mistake of not understanding. And I think it comes down to exam pressure, the timing and the amount of volume that's in a question that you need to see through that sometimes um, students tend to just overlook very easy and simple things. Yeah. Yes, yes. And on that, just on that point, um, last week I had Dave who does financial accounting and you were speaking about the principal bank of which when you're doing your tutorials, as and when you forget certain things, you jot them down. And the day before yes. the exam, you get back to that. Because what usually happens is that as you're preparing for the exam or the test, you get, you get so focused in all these technical things to understand that by the time you get to the test, you have forgotten about all of these basic stuff that actually, and you must. So, so, so the another tip is that, guys, back to the principal bank, because if you have the principal bank, you would have jotted down that usually when it comes to exam text as well as zero rated, it, it, it's just, you know, it's just not working out. So you'll be able to remember it. Thank yeah. you for that. So let's go to the second one where you said, um, actually, before we go to the second one, I have here on my notes that you said, so many students forget about the 95% de minimis rule. Please remind us what that is and if it's always very clear in the exam. Is it always clear or, you know, just briefly remind us on that one? So with the 95 de minimis, de minimis rule, it's a calculation. So mm -hmm. sometimes your lecturer will give it to you. Sometimes you're going to have to calculate it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not done in second year. It's mainly third year and PGDA. Mm -hmm. um, but the 95 de, de minimis rule, it says that if a, a company um, has split, um, a split supply, so taxable mm -hmm. and exempt, but your exam supplies are less than 5%, then it's deemed that 100% of your supplies are taxable. But if it's less than 95, so if you're on a 94%, then you've got to apportion the VAT. Mm -hmm. And that's a mistake everyone makes. And a nice thing that I did um, in my test for test two, which everyone missed, or only a few people caught, um, I had a split entity with a 94% um, taxable supplies, but there were certain items that were only allocated to the taxable portion of the business and people still went and apportioned it. So this is why I'm saying reading is so important. So what does the supply relate to? Does it relate to the entire business or only a specific portion? So only to the taxable, only to the exempt or to both. So that's what I'm saying is if you understand the concepts and you learn the rules, it's easy to then um, pick up these things and actually not make those common mistakes that most people make. And I mean, it can, it can be the difference between a pass and a fail, mm -hmm. a distinction and not a distinction. So it's important to learn the, the base, like you were saying, the concepts, the basics. If you know the basics, it's easy to then go back down to the principle of it and then apply it to the question. Yes. So on that one, on that one, I just want to, because you just said that it can be a difference between just passing or actually getting a distinction. So when it yeah. comes to this particular one where you would have to apply this 95% rule, is it a case of um, most of the times it's clear because now it's like maybe the mark allocation is a bit higher or would you say usually 
it's that mug it's that high level mug that actually gets you into a distinction so if you do forget about it most of the times you don't lose much or would you say it's actually most of the times it actually contributes to so much of the marks that are that are allocated for the question so i think it goes uh, according to how or what the lecturer is actually trying to test in that specific question so if they're trying to a test whether you can calculate the apportionment i'm sorry the percentage um and then apply to the question then that will be a bit of a higher grade sort of calculation and then you'll see that the mark allocation is in line with the amount of um transactions that they've provided um but if you if your lecturer is trying to test both income tax and vat mm-hmm. then you'll see that even if you've missed the apportionment so long as you've applied the income tax correctly you won't completely fail the question you might lose a lot of marks mm-hmm. but you can still pass the paper so mark allocations very good point you hit it on um mm-hmm. mark allocation is so important i mean i had students write a quarter page for a 20 marker um that's not going to get you anything <laughs> So you know you you've got to look at the mark allocation and then that also guides you to say okay I need to write um this amount I need to write that amount and also reading is it discussion and calculation is it only discussion is it only calculation and those are the things that actually guide you in terms of the length and the depth of your question as well as how much you actually need to write definitely definitely so guys for the people who just joined now We just discussed the difference between exempt as well as zero rated and we discussed that there are instances where you would have to apportion and we also just discussed the 95% rule. So if you get what we are talking about because this is the first time we're being very technical not just being general this is a specific um a specific topic which is vet. So if you are with us please just show us a hand in the comment section so that we see that everyone who's listening actually gets us and if you have any further question please comment that was a great one and the second one we're going to discuss i like this because it's been a while ever since i dealt with transfer duties uh the second <laughs> one is transfer duty versus vet and what happens if the entity purchases property from a non vendor so what do the students usually miss when it comes to this one so I think it's just information overload especially for the third years because transfer duty would be something new to them. Um so what happens is it's important to remember the rules around it. So very basically put transfer duty um would be payable if you purchase a property but it's not um always payable it depends on the value of the property if I'm not mistaken it's if it's above 900,000 rand. So the thing is you first need to identify who are we purchasing from and that's where a lot of people start um to get confused. So the question will say that it's purchased from a non-vendor for x amount and then you need to discuss and calculate um the transfer duty or if there's any transfer duty on this. Um and it's important to then compartmentalize the question to say okay I am purchasing from a non-vendor therefore transfer duty only because it's either transfer duty or vat. Hmm. And then and so you know that now you are paying transfer duty but you can't claim that transfer duty as your input vat because transfer duty is not input vat. Big mistake a lot of people make. So then you go down to the second principle of purchasing second hand items from a South African resident um who is in the country and the the properties in the country wait can i stop you there because i was yeah. still on this point before we go to the resident and non resident base so you just cuz cuz i just want to know if we we really are getting this because it's it's, yeah. it's good for me because tax is also not my strong point so when it comes to transfer duty is usually when you are for example buying property right so you yeah. were saying that it can either you can either have transfer duty or you can have vat right When you say you can either have transfer duty or that are you saying that that only applies when it's in relation to a non vendor or you saying that all around regardless of who you are transacting with you can either have transfer duty or that you can have both So I'm going to put it from the from the point of view of a company because if I have to go any further into it it might confuse those that are doing of uh, individual taxes. Mm. So from a company perspective remember if the company um I see someone saying 
good and bad table. I'll come to that. Oh, um, yes, please. I don't even know what that is. So, yes, please. No, that's, that's, not for, that's not for that. Um, okay. So, so with, with transfer duty, I'm going to put it from a company's perspective because I think that's more applicable. So remember, if a company is um, registered for VAT and then they purchase property, then it will either be that you are paying transfer duty or VAT yes. because as a company, you will not pay both. Mm. So then you need to look at, is this company purchasing it from a, a non-vendor or a vendor? And if it's purchased from a vendor, then there would be um, VAT involved. But mm. if it's from a non-vendor, then it's going to be transfer duty. Mm-hmm. And then the rules for secondhand um, items purchased from a non-vendor. Yes. So you need to compartmentalize the question and first understand who are we purchasing from yes. and um, what is the initial transaction. Mm. Um, and then that sort of flows out the rest of your question. That, that is brilliant. That, that is brilliant. Uh, yeah, I feel like I just revised all of it now. <laughs> so with regards to this, the second point you're coming to is secondhand, right? So yes. property can either be new or it can be secondhand. Before yes. we go into that, will the rules differ when it comes to whether you bought it from a vendor or from a non-vendor? When it comes to whether it's new or secondhand? So generally, generally, if you're looking at it, unless property is purchased new and unused from a developer, it's mm-hmm. going to be secondhand. So mm-hmm. nine out of 10 times, I would say your property is going to be secondhand. Mm-hmm. And property, if you look at the definition of secondhand goods and property in the VAT ledge, you'll see that goods and property are defined, um, sorry, property is defined as a good and therefore yes. it, it it does follow through with the, with um having to claim input VAT or notional input VAT mm-hmm. on secondhand goods. Um, so I would say is when in doubt, go with your gut of it being secondhand, unless it tells you that it's purchased from a developer or somewhere else, it's generally going to be secondhand because someone would have used it or use it for business or whatever it is before they actually sold it off. Yes. Um, so again, reading the question, very important. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when it comes to the second hand, then what are the implications? What do we consider going forward? And what do the students usually miss when it comes to that? So with second hand goods, it's important to understand when can you claim notional input VAT. Mm-hmm. So it would be the requirement. So it must be purchased from a, from a South African resident. The goods must be in South Africa. So obviously property has to be in South Africa for you to claim the notional input VAT if you are purchasing from a non-vendor and have paid transfer duty. Mm. And then um, thirdly, it must be used. So it must qualify as the definition of used goods in, mm. order, for it, uh, in order for you to claim the notional input. Mm. Um, so when we're looking at this, it's just not for property. It's also for any sort of secondhand good mm. that is purchased by an entity that is registered for VAT. Um, these are the requirements that you need to look for um, when we um, when we are claiming notional input VAT or not. Okay, I see someone just asked on that. Yolanda said, can you please explain why it will be secondhand if new and unused purchase from a developer? No, sorry, maybe that was a little confusing. It's not yeah, it's new, not, sorry, it's not secondhand. Because, yeah. 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 So what I was trying to say that is you need to identify whether it's from a developer, like new and unused, then it, secondhand, um, the notional input would not be applicable. But if it's from someone who's used it, then the secondhand notional input would be applicable. So mm-hmm. if it's from a developer who's just developed the property or put it up from, from, from the ground up, um, then it would be new and unused and therefore notional would not be applicable. Yes, yes. Okay, I really like this one. So guys, um, I'm not going to repeat this one. I think it was very, very clear when it comes to transfer duty versus VET and what students usually miss. So if you are with us, this is the second point. Please give a thumbs up this time. If you really understand what we're talking about and you've learned something, if you are in second year and you haven't done transfer duty, it's all right. Don't worry. This video will still exist. You can come back to it. Okay, that was great. Thank you, Sadia. Let's move to the third tip. And you said that when it comes to the discussion questions, um, students usually theory dumb. And also, 
um, what they do is that they'll just take information from their tax legislation and conclude and forget about everything that is happening in the question. Do you want to elaborate further on that? Yeah, so what happens is, um, I'm going to use the sale of a going concern as an example. Again, third year, not second year, but you can use the application for it for second year also. So the question will state whether the entity is being sold as a going concern or not, and therefore can claim zero, uh, can uh, conclude the transaction as a zero rated um, mm -hmm. transaction. So what students will do is they'll write all the requirements for um, a sale of a going concern, but then they won't actually go and look at the scenario and apply to say, um, yes, both entities are a registered VAT vendor. Yes, um, the, um, the items used in the business will be sold, et cetera, et cetera. What they'll do is they'll write the requirements and then they'll conclude to say, yes, it is or no, it's not. And what happens there is that, um, and what's important is for ITC purposes, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, mm -hmm. you don't generally get marks for taking things out of legislation and putting it on the paper. You get the marks for application. And so it's very important, especially for, from a third year level, to start applying rather than just theory dumping um, in the hopes that you will pass. Because the sooner you get familiar with applying, the easier it will become ITC and it's even your, your PGDA paper. Mm -hmm. um, so always make sure that write the requirement and then apply it. So yes, both are registered VAT vendors or no, one is not and the other is. And go through all requirements because remember, if this is a 10 marker, you're not going to get 10 marks for writing the first requirement saying that no, they both are not VAT vendors, therefore. Um, go through all the requirements, apply each one, and then conclude to say based on one, two, three, um, yes, they will be, or one, two, three, they will not be. And then sometimes even put in a one-liner suggestion to say that um, if the entity agrees on this and this and this, then it will be sold as a sale of a going concern. Um, so this can be applied for any sort of that question. You could even have one, for example, let's go on a second year level, whether a person is a, should or should not register as a VAT vendor. The information is given to you. Um, let's assume they're under the 50,000 mm -hmm. threshold. So then you'll go through the requirements for registering, and then you'd say, based on the fact that, this, uh, that the supplies are under 50,000, they cannot voluntarily register. However, if um, this goes up in the future months or years, then they can voluntarily register. And if they go above the 1 mil million, they, can, they have to. Yes. Um, so can I ask, when you're saying that you can go a step further and suggest that, would you, it gets back to, would you say that's actually a higher grade mark? That's, that's your difference between pass and distinction? Or would you say that's always a necessity when answering a question? Now, it's not always the necessity to answer the question, but, and like I'm saying is, if you want to put in the suggestion as your one marker, higher grade, because I know for my papers, I always have it there to say, if the student has actually gone one step further to explain, um, this is how we are going to fix the, but it's a one or two line and not a half a page. Um, I always have a mark there for a possible solution to the to the problem. So it's more of a higher grade. It, it's more of a getting you to the distinction rather than the pass or the fail. So if you don't do it, it it's not necessary um, unless it's stated in the question. Um, but it's always there on my memo. So I'm not sure about the other universities. Have a look at your, at your lecturer's memos to see, do they have a one marker for it? Or is it only relevant to if they ask you um, for a suggestion to fix the problem? Yes, yes. So on that one as well, I just want to ask another question to clarify. You say that we have to take the requirements and apply them. Does yes. it mean, when it comes to the requirement, does it mean you're expecting the student to rewrite their requirements as per the legislation or to you expecting them to just quote the section and just write the application or rewrite the requirements but in their own words? What are you expecting when it comes to writing the requirement and the application? Because we've discovered that you can't, you you cannot just go on and not write the application. The application will always be there. But when it comes to the time pressure that you have, what do you do in terms of stating the requirements? 
so rewriting word for word from the ledge is a very bad idea because sometimes the legislation's requirement is three lines long. So this is again where understanding what you are what you are studying comes into play. Um, I can go on this based on papers that I've seen from other universities and the way we set ours. Generally, writing a requirement for third year level only gives you a half a mark, whereas for PGDA, I see there's no marks allocated to it. So know the level of the paper that you are writing to understand the mark allocation for requirements versus application. You'll get more marks for application than requirements. Now, with the requirements and what you need to write, it's an excellent question because you see various things that students actually do. Mm. If, you can, if you can paraphrase the requirement correctly, um, it doesn't need to be word for word from the lead, but I as the lecturer can understand for a sale of a going concern, both entities need to be a registered bad vendor. That's a mm. half a line that you're writing and it goes directly with what the legislation is saying. So where you can paraphrase it, but make sure that it's in line with what the legislation is actually saying. Don't go and write the whole thing. You're not going to get the marks and then you're going to waste time. Hmm. So write the requirements in your words, but the requirements are in line with the legislation, if that okay. makes sense. That's great. That, that makes perfect sense. On the same one, let's say as part of the solution, I'm, I'm not sure which cases are there for that. I honestly can't remember. But then let's say for other questions as well. If you have a question and you can apply a principle from a case. Yes. You know, what are you, I, is the student expected to just write the name of the case and then just, you know, and just say maybe the principle in brackets? In as, you know, how much detail do you need so that you can know that the student really understood the case in relation to the principle? Yeah, cases is a very interesting one. Um, for that, there aren't many that you need to actually know. And it's very seldom that you'd actually need to apply court cases for that. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you need to put the court case with the correct principle. Again, sometimes the principle is three lines long. If you can paraphrase the principle to hit on the specifics for it, you'll get the mark for it. So long as it makes sense and it's in line with what it's supposed to be, it's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so, for example, a good example is fissur. Fissur is the tree and the fruit. So, if some some um, some principles have it as a two-liner, um, if the student says that fissur, the principle identified was that capital uh, items are seen as the tree, whereas revenue items are seen as the fruit, that's a hundred percent correct. You don't need to write the full three-liner to actually mm -hmm. get the mark. So long as you can identify the main thing of the principle and write it down, um, we generally award you the marks. Again, mm -hmm. look at who your lecturer is. Um, certain lecturers are more strict than other lecturers. So um, having a look at the papers that, they, that they've set previously and also looking at ITC papers to see how are the marks allocated, that gives you a good idea to start learning from the get-go um, how ITC marks and how you're going to learn um, to to answer papers for ITC purposes and actually get your marks come um, in your fifth year when you are writing um, board exams in Jan. Yes, that's great. So guys, if you just joined, we are on our third question and we're talking about discussion questions and um, specifically when it comes to answering VET discussion questions. Sadia gave so many tips. So for time's sake, again, I'm not going to repeat everything because I think it was very clear. I see Karabo said this is a very good question. And Krebsy said, this is so helpful. So if you have any additional information, any additional question, you can comment here. But however, if you do get the principles we're talking about, all the tips we're talking about in number three, please this time give us a peace sign. Just give us a peace sign. Then we know that when it comes to the third one that we discussed, which is discussion questions, you actually do understand it. Okay. So moving on, moving on. I'm excited about this one because so many people DM'd me <laughs> saying vet adjustments, vet adjustments, vet adjustments. So for the fourth one, our tip is on vet adjustments. Yeah. I'm not even going to read what you wrote to me now because I think you are the best person who can be concise <laughs> and, and really explain it. I, I don't know why people are panicking about vet adjustments. When I saw my DMs, I was like, 
what's happening with that adjustment? So what are the students struggling with when it comes to that adjustment? I think it's just the confusion as to why it's being reversed or why are we actually doing this? So one nice tip is um, UNISA actually has from their VAT unit guide a very nice summary of VAT adjustments for all type of VAT transactions. And this comes from the CTA one. So mm-hmm. you can even use it for third year and link it for what's applicable for only third year and then use it for fourth year as well. Um, okay, can but, I start there? You said yeah. what does the UNISA have and where do the students get it? So if you Google, Google is your friend here. <laughs> if you Google VAT UNISA, you'll find the unit guide. In that unit guide for VAT, there's a... Um, if you go all the way through, you'll see at the bottom, there's a nice little table. It's so brilliantly drawn up. So uh, hats off to the lecturer who's actually done this. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does the VAT adjustment as well as time and value of supplies. Um, it just, it so nicely lays out what's the rules around it and how do you actually go about um, using these rules for specific transactions. Um, so maybe I can send it to you if, um, if you can put it up somewhere yes, for them. Please send me the link and I'll just put it on our bio for Nova Learning Center so that they can, they yeah. can just click and, and get this. Okay. It's so, so yeah. Yes. Yes. It's so, so you're saying and, what do students struggle with? So it's just understanding what actually needs to be done. Remember with a VAT adjustment, it's an adjustment because something has been done which either needs to be reversed out or, or carried on further or someone hasn't done something which you now need to go back and make an adjustment for it. So if it's, for example, a bad debt adjustment, right? Think about it from the sense of what was the initial transaction? So what happened when we sold the goods to the customer? This is the transaction we've written out and write out the transaction. Now, if we're telling you that the data has gone bad and we need to adjust the VAT, reverse the transaction. So if it was initially an input VAT, for example, sorry, it would have been an output VAT. Remember, if it was an output VAT and now the data has gone bad, reverse the transaction and make it an input VAT. Um, That goes one further to say that what happens if your bad debt comes back and pays you. That also confuses everyone. And then you go through the thought process of saying, okay, initially when that person purchased, this is the transaction I've done. Then they went bad, this was the transaction I've done. Now that they've come back and paid me, this is the adjustment I need to make. So start on a thought process of what was the initial transaction? Why do we need to adjust it? And then go on, how do we actually adjust it? So go through the process rather than just jumping straight to a conclusion and then not understanding why you are doing what you are actually doing definitely i think really um it's all about what has happened and what am i trying to get to and when it comes to the adjustments you are just bridging that because this has happened we can't really do much about it it's either we get rid of it or which we reverse it and then do a, go- a, 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 a relevant one, or we can either adjust that to get to the right one. But I, I really do think what students should remember is that you actually, you have to, you know, you have to come up with the bridge. Without you yes. doing something, that incorrect thing will stay there. And you just coming and doing the right thing, that is just doubling everything and we are not getting to our goal. So that's a great yes. one. That's, that's, that's really a great one. And guys, just like what Saria has said now, I'll, I'll save the link to the UNISA guide on, um, on all the tips that they have on vet adjustments and everything. So, so yeah, be on the lookout. I'll also announce it on my stories. This was good and brief. I, I really do think you explained it so well. <laughs> I was worried about the, what are people not getting? But now I get it. Now I get it. Okay. Someone said something here. Uh, Zika Lala said, I am struggling with the sale of going concern regarding VAT adjustment. Okay, so Zika Lala, before we get back to your solution, do you mean, um, I think this would, would be in relation to a specific scenario. I don't think this is something yeah. that you can actually just give advice. I think just like what Sadia said, um, it's all about what has happened at first. And 
you understanding what should always happen you should be able to actually draw the bridge so so when it comes to that one um zikalala i really do think it comes back to the 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 basic critical principles that sadia just discussed now so that is the fourth one guys um so yeah that that was great that was really great so let's get back to our voting method to see that everyone really understands let's get back to giving high fives to say i understand number 4 what we discussed about what we can do when it comes to vet adjustments and proper comment saying okay i'll i'll go to your bio, bio so that i can get the unisa guide on vet adjustments which will definitely help you so high five just to give an indication that we are all together okay so um last but not least before we go to general tips um you say that when it comes to time and value of the supplies students usually confuse this what what do you mean about students confusing the time and value of the supplies when it comes to vet okay so for second year time and value is done very generally so it's usually um for time of supply it would be the early of payment or um invoice and then for supply it would be the amount or um the open market value less the vat so it's very generally done in second year so what i've noticed is this year when we did for third year it just went over everyone's head they're like why are we actually doing this what's the purpose of it and then they just don't understand why why are we doing specific time and values for specific transactions So my 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 advice here is and I think even for PGDA I've had a discussion with a few students that they struggle with this even at PGDA level and the first thing here is to understand the general rule so always start at the basics what is the general rule that would go for 8 out of 10 transactions if you can understand the reason for it behind the general rule then going to the special rules comes in a bit easier um also when you are studying start off with the easier stuff understand the basic rules first before you actually go on to the more complex and complicated stuff so for example a nice funny as i like to call it um for time and value of supplies is installment credit agreements rental agreements um sometimes export as well it confuses students so again you know doing the table in terms of these are the general rules and then at the bottom of your table going for all the special rules and all the funnies with the time and values also then goes and helps a student understand why we are doing this at this specific um time so if you can write down for example an installment credit agreement um these are the rules related to time and value and then think about it okay so if this is the entity that i'm dealing with um this is the scenario now from a very logical point of view why wouldn't the general rule apply and um, it would be because um the specific factors involved with an installment credit agreement that does not allow you to use the general rules this is why sars has come up with special rules so try and think of it from a very logical point of view and put it into a ordinary daily scenario of in real life this is what would happen and this is why sars has actually thought of this um to put in this specific rule and why the general rule will not apply and then also remember the aren't a lot of funny there's a handful of them but lecturers love testing it so also know what are your funnies and what are the rules related to those funnies and again if you can understand the logic behind it um it will make it easier to understand the rules behind those specific funny sort of um time and value of supplies yes can i please get charity on this one so for people who just joined uh we discussing our five our fifth tip rather which is um the 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 the, the problems that be, that students actually encounter when they are dealing with time and value of the supplies so sadia just spoke about the fact that um we always have to be aware of the general rules and the special rules because usually you'll always have your general rules when it comes to the time and value of the supplies but however there'll always be those funnies of which lectures tend to test right and you gave a good example now about the installment sales agreement right yes and you said that um there'll be instances where the general time and value rules will always apply however 
whenever they are funnies, we'll have to always apply logic and see what would sounds do, right? So can you give us an example of what would, what would maybe be a funny in this case? And what is the norm? Let's start with what is the norm and what would be the funny when it comes to this installment sales agreement? Maybe? <laughs> Okay, so off the top of my head, sometimes I also need my yes, rules yes, in front of to be, Just to, you know, yeah. just to, yeah. Okay, so so with with uh, with the norm, um, okay, so remember that, um, for example, with an installment credit agreement, let's start with that one. Um, it would be a situation where a taxpayer purchases something, but it's on an installment credit. So generally, there would be um, the sales price, you'd have interest, and then it takes it takes a number of months for you to pay that off. So then you've got to first identify the number of stakeholders in this transaction. There would be the bank, the person you are purchasing from and yourself. And then going down to say, um, in this instance, who would, uh, who would I pay? Who would pay the, the, the person that I'm purchasing from? And then break it down from there. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because I think it's going to confuse people. But then, for example, in that sort of instance, you ask yourself, why would the basic general rule not apply? And it would be because it's a bit of a complex situation with more than one person involved or a very um, complex sort of transaction. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they might just not be as straightforward as the early of date uh, of invoice or date of payment, but it would actually be... Um, because of this specific reason, we have to actually go a little further to look at the special rule of, um, that needs to be applied. So again, um, the UNISA table that was made, brilliant for this because it really goes down to showing you um, for, for these specific funnies, so to say, what are the rules involved for it? And once you have a look at it, you'll also see that um, if you think of it from, from a practical point of view, it makes sense um, yes. if that helps. Yes, yes. No, that, that definitely helps. So, um, guys, just remember, I will be putting a link up with, um, with this UNISA, UNISA summary or, or tips when it comes to that. Um, but now, the main thing from this one really is just remembering that they can be funnies and that will provide an exception to the main general rules, right? So, yes. always, always remember that this can be a case. You don't always have to um, lean into your general rules if they don't apply because the scenario has changed. Okay, thank you for that. Um, guys, if you understand that, for now, let's get back to thumbs up. If you really understood the fifth tip, thumbs up. And if you have further questions, you can type there. So lastly, what we're going to do is that we are going to look at the, just the general tips, just to wrap up this, general tips. The first one, you said um, over-relying on legislation. So students still over-rely on legislation. <laughs> <laughs> um, over-relying on the legislation, very bad idea. So it comes back to understanding what you are studying. If you understand the concept and the legislation, um, when it comes to the test of the exam, you, you don't need to flip through your textbook all the time. What will happen is you will come and only use that legislation to double check that you've used the correct principle, that um, you haven't made a mistake. Or if you are in doubt, to flip through that section and say, okay, actually, I was wrong because of this. Oh, okay, I'm right, so let me carry on. So it's something I emphasize a lot in my class to say, please just don't parrot fashion learn so to say or learn from a memo when you are learning understand what it is that is said why is it this way and how do i apply it not to just the question in front of me but to a, a wide variety of questions which might be posed um by any lecturer because remember um itc is not set by your lecturer it's set by lecturers from all over the country so Please understand how to apply to any specific question, not just your, your lecturer's questions, because sometimes we tend to get very comfortable um, with our lecturer and therefore we like start relying on our legislation because we know. Um, and true. remember, yeah, so over relying on the legislation, both for VAT or income tax. Try not do that because it wastes so much of time flipping through that legislation, reading what it is. Um, 
that you are trying to understand. And sometimes you get confused because uh, it doesn't make sense in the test. So rely more on yourself and the fact that you've studied correctly, you've studied enough, and that it is, it is there as a tool, not a crutch. So don't use it as a crutch. Formulas are very important to flag in your ledge. So use it for your formulas to make sure that you have the correct formulas and how to apply the formulas. But don't use it for looking for specific pieces of legislation and then spending 25 minutes trying to understand um, why, why is this here? How are we going to apply it? Because you probably end up not finishing up the question to begin with. Definitely, definitely. So on that one, um, would you say that the time that the students have in the exam, do you factor the fact that they still have to page through their legislation? Or it's just about the student has studied, has studied and therefore they just have to deliver? Yeah, so it goes again on the level that you are setting at. So for third year, we would, when we set the question, we factor in that, yes, they would need to page a little bit. So the depth of the question would be not as intense as a PGDA or a ITC question. But remember, once you come to PGDA, it's assumed that you should know your work. Know the information already. Yes. Okay. So, so, yeah. So for me, I would say when you are going to write, assume that you don't have your text there. Your text yes. is like dialing 911. It's not you studying. It's like mm -hmm. proper dialing 911 and being like, I really have to double check this. But other than that, your legislation, your standards, your ISIS, everything just has to chill there. And only in emergencies, you can quickly just flip through. So that's a good Hundred one. Um, and then you said, I like this tip. I like this tip because I, I, I really didn't know this. You said that there are students who actually study from silk or hot. How do you spell that? How do you pronounce hot. it? Hot. <laughs> so you're saying that when you're studying that, it's better to study it from the legislation instead of from silk or hot. And why is that? Okay, so you need to use your ledge and silk together or hopped, whichever textbook you are actually using. But you'll notice that the textbook goes in order of the section. So it starts from section one and it goes all the way through. And you'll see that it starts confusing exam zero rated, standard rated, etc. So a lot of the times the students that start using silk or hopped abandon it because they get confused. Now, the thing is the textbook is so good because it explains the what's in the legislation because the legislation is not written in English that we understand. So when I when I set my slides this semester and when I taught it, I didn't teach it in order of the sections because the sections confuse you because it jumps. So what I did was I went and I grouped it as exempt, zero rated and standard rated. Mm -hmm. And then I and you'll see that you'll flip through the textbook a lot, but that's fine because of the fact that um if you are using the textbook correctly to understand standard rated, zero rated and exempt, um, you're not going to go in the order of the textbook because it will start off with standard rated. Then you need to flip forward to time and value. Then you need to flip forward to adjustments. So my tip there is when you are using silk and if you rely on it a lot, um, maybe flag that for silk purposes. So maybe use a blue flag for standard rated, uh, orange flag for exempt and a red flag for zero rated. And then you can see that, okay, these are the sections that relate only to this specific part of that. Um, and then also maybe use a different color flag for all your funnies. So I, when I lectured that this semester, I started off with, a, with um, the basics of that. So that was registration, um, it would be, uh, when do you need to submit your returns, etc. Then I went on to exempt because exempt is the easiest and the shortest mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Then I left in the next week, zero rated and standard rated. And I finished it off in the third week with adjustments in all the funnies. So if you can do it in sections rather than sitting with it in one go, you'll see that you don't get scared of um, the chapter itself because a lot of people find it intimidating because it's so many pages, it's so many concepts, it's so many things to go through. So compartmentalize it into standard exams, zero rated uh, adjustments and your funnies. And then you'll see that if you can identify what goes where, you'll actually find it a lot more helpful. And the other thing is when you are going through silk, 
sometimes it seems so silly to go through the small examples, but the small examples actually sometimes bring about um, concepts that you actually forgot or didn't go through or might have missed. So do every single example in self that is applicable to the sections that you need to do because you'll see how many things you actually pick up from those little examples and things that you thought you knew but might have missed. Um, so yeah, just don't get scared with it and use your silk as a tool also. Learn from it and go through it and use it in conjunction with your legislation. So you need both. You can't abandon one for the other. It needs to be used together and not separately. So that's, that's my biggest job to you. That, that's a great one. That's, that's really, that's a game changer, especially when it comes to study techniques. That's a real game changer. Because honestly, I, when I studied text, I don't think I did that. And I think this would have made my life so easy. So guys, just remember, Sadia is saying that your self is not, uh, is not grouping everything into this is zero rated, this is exempt, this is that. So you keep on flipping around if you want to do that, but it's the easiest way to actually be able to group between different groups and group the adjustments and group everything else so that it all flows and eventually it'll all come together instead of just studying it section per section. That's a great yeah. tip. So guys, if you understand that tip and you appreciate it the way I do, please give us a star in the comment section so that we see that you actually get it. That, that's a great one. I, I would have really, really appreciated this one. Okay, I think we have um, the last one. Yeah, I think we do have the last one where you said, giving students, uh, you said students usually get frustrated with that. Um, so yeah, last words, last words on, on um, on students' frustrations with that. So that is not a monster that it looks like. It's just that it's different, and it's and it's just one more step in your income tax calculation. So if you are going to go into studying that with a mindset of oh my god, this is the most horrible thing, and a lot of times you'll get prior students that have done it that that hated it. Um, so my 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 tip is please don't listen to other people. Um, start with it yourself and get a feel for it. Don't get frustrated with it because the minute you're going to start getting frustrated and hate it, it's going to be a total mind block and then you're not going to actually learn what you need to. So start with it from your own. Make a game plan when you start studying. So this is the way I'm going to go through it. And then also remember, rely on your lecturers. We are here to help you. So if something doesn't make sense, don't sit and suffer in silence. Go and ask for help. Ask a friend that you know is either good at it, someone that has, um, you know, passed PGDA or ITC and is good at, uh, at, at that. Um, ask your lecturer, ask your tutor, ask someone for help rather than sitting and suffering by yourself. Um, so don't get frustrated with it. And remember, that is separate from income tax. It's not income tax. Mm -hmm. So please don't confuse the principles and that's another thing that happens a lot. People confuse the principles of VAT with income tax. Remember, income tax is the first thing that you need to kill in a calculation. So kill the VAT correctly, then proceed with the income tax. Um, yeah, but don't get frustrated with it. Look, um, I understand the frustration. I mean, I think most of my class got frustrated learning VAT for three weeks. Um, but also remember now that you are not at uni at the moment. If that was something that was done in the first three weeks of your semester or something that you've started, uh, spend this time because it's actually valuable for you to catch up what you didn't know. So spend this next few weeks um, really understanding what you're doing. Um, reach out to your lecturers if they're available or a tutor or someone and ask them for help. Um, so that in this time that we are not um, doing any teaching, you actually can catch up very nicely. And when uh, when the semester does resume and teaching does start, that you're actually on a, uh, on, on a better foot um, than when you, when you left on the last day of your last lecture. That's great. Thank you, Sadia. So I'm just going to do a quick recap before everyone leaves. Um, Firstly, um, I said I was going to do a giveaway here, but I see only about 29 people were, were able to make it. So I don't think 
it'll be fair to only limit it to the people who are here. So I'll probably do the tag slash giveaway very soon. For the people who've asked questions, I don't think this live should be too long so that when other people are coming back, they can be able to catch up quickly. So um, any other questions, I will be answering them in my stories or maybe as a post because I see even Pilogus has said, any tips on flagging the tag slash? So we'll look at all the other questions that are not answered here. So quickly, I'm just going to recap. And um, on the this was all about VET and what students usually get wrong and anything else that we can actually help with. And the first one, we spoke about um, zero-rated exempted services, zero-rated goods, um, standard goods. Oh my gosh, that was just thrown <laughs> all over. <laughs> but you get the point. If you are here early, you get the point. So we spoke about the differences and how students actually confuse your input vet as well as your output vet. So when you rewatch this, you'll get it. And we also spoke about your 95% de minimis, de minimis rule that you shouldn't forget. And then secondly, we discussed the issues that students have when it comes to transfer duty versus vet. This was my personal favorite because I, I really do. I get why students will struggle and I like how you put it, Sadia. It was, it was very, very clear. So guys, uh, you can get back onto this live once we're done. And then third one, we're talking about approaching theory questions in VET and how you can actually apply this. And I like how we actually looked at this from a different perspective. We didn't really look at it the way we discussed IFRS with Dave. So guys, also check this out. And we also spoke about uh, applying your cases as well. So we just um, added something on top of that. And then the fourth one, we spoke about VET adjustments because you guys love VET adjustments. Um, yeah, we did speak about uh, so many things. But out of that, I did promise you that I'll send you the link to the UNISA um, summary of VET tips or whatever it is. But all I know is that it's very helpful. So Sadia is going to give me that link and I'll post it on the Novalu Learning Center page on this platform. And then the fifth one, we spoke about time and value of the supplies because this changes. Um, there are general rules and there are special rules and you always have to look out for those special rules when they actually apply. And now we just wrapped it up with few tips on actually not over relying on your vet, how you can use your textbook and your legislation. And the fact that whilst you're still at home now, have a game plan, email your lecturers, revise what you can revise now. And, and yeah, guys, you can do it. The vet is not really as bad if you give it a chance. Um, any last words, Sadia? Um, I think during this time, just try and do as much as you can. Um, and I don't know, be positive and try and understand where your mistakes were. And hopefully, you know, this helped and